Amen. Living Faith Church, we welcome you today. We are so glad that you're here. I just want to open with a reading of God's Word. And I'm in the book of Acts chapter 15. And what had happened in the church, as the church began to grow and began to explode in Jerusalem, and it had actually moved out of Jerusalem, one of the interesting facts was is that God had begun to do a tremendous work in the Gentile people. And there began to be a division that arose among the Jewish people that had been saved and born again. And they, they were having a, a hard time understanding that God was grafting in the Jewish convert, uh, the Gentile converts. And so they had what's called the First Council of Jerusalem. And at that council, the Apostle Paul was there. Apostle Peter was there, and Peter spoke up, and he said, This is what God is doing. God is not just move, going to minister at this time just to the commonwealth of Israel. God is now taking the blessing and the kingdom of God to the entire world and the Gentile people. And Peter re reiterates that. And then after Peter stands up and he gives this testimony, and he gives this word from the Lord, James, Jesus' half-brother, who was Jesus, this was Jesus' half-brother, James, who wrote the book of James. James stands up, and he addresses the council at Jerusalem. And then when all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had done among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Hearken unto me. Simon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of the people a people for his name. God has taken you out for his name. Do you understand that? God has taken you out for his name. And, and the, name, the name that God has given you, I'm going to talk about that, what the Bible calls you. God has given you a very specific name. And James says, To this I agree that the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return, and I will build again the tabernacle of David. Oh, oh hallelujah. Which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue of men, that's what Gentiles were called, the residue of men, might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Everybody say, from the beginning of the world. Of the world. That's really, really important that James added that. Father, we pray right now, you're anointing on the word of God as we get into this sermon today. That God, you are up to something in the earth. Father, we praise you and thank you that when the enemy comes in like a flood, your word says that you will raise up a standard, and the standard is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, Jesus, we thank you that you are the very standard of God in our midst today, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, as a pastor, one of the things that people ask me, Pastor Steve, are we in the last days? And everybody, when something like this happens and we have a pandemic and we have these kind of issues, and the, the, the thing about this one, this is worldwide, and that's interesting because this is not just happening in America, this is not just happening in Canada, not just in the, north, uh, the Western Hemisphere, this is worldwide, and that's really important to understand, that this pandemic is worldwide and we have a world in chaos over this. And so I want to ask you a question. The Bible talks about minor prophets and major prophets. Who was the greatest prophet in the Bible? I, I heard it. Somebody said it. Jesus. Jesus is the greatest prophet in the Bible. If you ask most people, they'll talk about Elijah, they'll talk about Isaiah. But Jesus Christ is the greatest prophet in the Bible. And so it's very important that you know that because if you know Jesus is the greatest prophet in the Bible, it takes you from religion to relationship because you understand the words of Jesus are the most important words in your Bible. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ are the most important words in your Bible. Say the words in red. They are really, really important. And I believe that God is driving us back to that time where we get back in love and get back into relationship with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus came to give us relationship, not religion. God wants to have a relationship. How many of you want to have a relationship with your children? Yes. A deep, meaningful relationship with your children? I won't know where you got that. Why do you have that desire innate in you to have a relationship with, with your children? Many people talk about the fivefold ministry of the church, which is the apostle, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But how many know Jesus had a fivefold ministry also? Jesus said in the model prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. So in the church we have the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But what is the fivefold ministry of Christ? Savior, Lord, prophet, priest, and king. Jesus has a fivefold ministry also. The fivefold ministry the church has, it emanated in heaven from Jesus Christ, our great prophet, priest, and king. 
So people ask me, Pastor, is, is this the end? Is this the beginning of the end? And nobody knows the day and the hour. And I'm not going to say that. But Jesus said there's one thing very particular and very clear that you can understand from Scripture. Jesus said, I'm going to tell you the event that will trigger the end time. I'm going to tell you the event. I'm going to tell you the event. Do you know that's in God's Word? And it was prophesied by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24. The disciples had come to Jesus in the last week of Jesus' life in Matthew 24. Jesus begins to deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he begins to pronounce to the Pharisees and the Sadducees the woes and the judgments that are coming on the nation of Israel because of their rejection of Christ. And in that, the apostles begin to understand, hold it, he, he, he's really begin to talk at another level about something different, about a second kingdom, about him coming again. And so they ask Jesus, would you tell us what this is all about? When is the end going to come? Everybody ask, say with me, when is the end going to come? We're going to answer that from Scripture. Not from my words, but from the words in red. Is that okay? If we look at that. In, so in Matthew 24, they had come to Jesus. And they said, Jesus, when is this last time going to come? When are the end times you're coming again? And Jesus first, he says, okay, well, first of all, you've got to understand. There's going to be false preachers and teachers come. There's going to be false religion. He said there's going to be wars, rumors of wars. There's going to be famine. There's going to be pestilence. Pestilence is disease. He said there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be famine, wars, rumors of wars and earthquakes. Many false teachers will come. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 3, he said, when are these things going to come? And so Jesus gives the answer to their question in Matthew 3, in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then... The end shall come. So no, we don't know the day or the hour. We don't know the moment. And I'm not saying I do. But I can tell you the event is when we get busy and do our job of taking the gospel of the kingdom. Not the gospel of religion. Not the gospel of men. The gospel of the red. The, what's red in your Bible? The gospel of the kingdom to the world. That's when the end will come. Is when we do our job. When the church does our job. And that's what's going on in the world. Right now, this, oh, I'm so excited about this sermon. I can't stand it. This is why the kingdom gospel is so important. Because Jesus said, when this gospel is preached, the end will come. When this, brothers and sisters, what you see the enemy doing right now is he understands his time is short. Yes. He's read, do you know that the, you know the devil reads the Bible? He, he, he just doesn't, he doesn't believe it. In fact, Jesus said that the, the demons, they, 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 they fear and tremble over the word of God. So Satan knows his time is short. So that's why the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of denominations. Ooh, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but not the gospel of religion, not the gospel of denominations, not the theology of man, not, not isms. God said, this is what he said, when the gospel of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ is preached and his gospel alone, then the end will come. Oh, hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying, this is what will be the trigger point of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, we don't know the date, the hour, the time, but we know the event. We can read God's scripture right here. It's in red in your Bible. We just quit reading the red. Today, I'm going to tell you it's time to get back to reading the red. So this is the message that is so important in the kingdom of God. The COVID-19 worldwide event you see is a world event. And you need to understand something. Anytime you see a world event, know this in your spirit. And this, God is up to something in the earth. God is up to something. Say it with me. God is up to something. Anytime you see the world involved in a crisis or a situation, God is up to something. I'm going to prove that with a little history here in a minute. So the COVID-19 event you see is spiritually you need to understand what is God doing? In fact, in Isaiah, God asked the prophet Isaiah, I do something no, I do, I'm doing something new. And he says, don't you perceive it in your spirit? Don't you behold it? Don't you understand? I'm here to tell you today, brothers and sisters, God is up to something new. God is up to something fantastic. God is up to something unimaginable. And we're just sitting here watching TV, uh, does, dining out on, on uh, some what do you call that? Netflix? I don't even know what that is. I don't have it, but I know people watch it. And that's what the church is watching. It's time to open your Bible again and read the red and see what God's up to. God is up to something in the earth. Can you say amen? amen. I can tell you he is. I'm about to tell you what it is. Hallelujah. It's time to rejoice, saying to God, God is on the move. God is on the move. Have you ever heard of a little thing called World War II? Anybody ever heard of the thing called World War II? Are there any history buffs here at all? <laughs> I remember talking to my grandmother about World War II. And do you know in World War II when that happened, they believed that was the end of the world. 
They believe that was the apocalypse. And if you live through that and you listen to the different things that were happening in the earth, and we saw the things now in history that we look back and we can see how horrible and tragic that was. Do you know most of the church believed that Jesus Christ was going to come at the end of that World War II or in the middle of it? Because things were so bad among the world, so bad among men, that people thought there's no way humanity can survive this. There's no way to get out of this. Jesus has to come. That, you talk to, I'm not going to say age, talk to anybody that lived through World War II, and if they were believers, they will tell you they believed that Jesus Christ had to come in the middle of that apocalypse. That's what they believed. And I've talked to Christian people that have lived through that, and that's what they said. But how many know he didn't come right after World War II? The earth survived, it kept going on, and the problem was we hadn't preached the gospel to the whole world yet. God is honoring His Word. God will honor, always honor His Word. God will always honor His Word. God's not willing that any perish. God's after souls. So in 1955, they had a great symposium. And what happened was, is they had realized that all these preachers and teachers and evangelists were telling everybody during the war, you better get ready, you better get ready, you better get saved, and, and, and you better get a relationship with God. And that's true, and yea and amen. You need to have that no matter what's going on in the world. But they realized, we missed... We missed our prophecies. We missed. We thought God was going to come back. It was so horrible. No way man could survive. And they missed it. So they had a symposium in 1955. And they realized we can't be telling people God is coming back and then mislead people. And be true to God's word. And this is what, this is what that symposium and some of the greatest minds, theologies and teachers in the, in the world at the time came together. And you know what they came up with? Do you know what the result of World War II produced in the earth? Can I tell you? Can I tell you? It's in your Bible. It's in your Bible. And it was the miracle of the rebirth of Israel as a nation. That is exactly what God did. To the horror of man, he brought the rebirth of Israel. And World War II allowed that to happen. Oh, can you say amen? Can you shout how your Bible prophesied Israel would be born in a day? And on the clock of God's eschatology in time, the birth of Israel and the nation of Israel is one of the most important keys to the end times we will ever have. So through all the horror of World War II, can I tell you, there's, there's, there's a little thing that happened in World War II that made it very clear what Satan was trying to do and what he was trying to stop. Satan knew God was up to something. So he had a guy named Hitler start killing Jewish people. He had a guy named Hitler start killing Jewish people. Because you know what? God was getting ready to call his people back to their homeland, Israel. And you understand that Satan said, I don't know what he's doing, but something to do with Israel. And so what happened is Satan, he, Adolf Hitler had a plan. It's in his book, Mein Kampf. Read it. Read it. I dare you to read it. And he says exactly what he's going to do. Many Jews got out of Europe before he did what he did. And the reality is, God said, I'm about to bring my people home. I'm about to reestablish Israel. And when I establish Israel, get ready, because I'm moving, and I'm shaking, and I'm going to move in the earth in a mighty way, in a mighty fashion. And it was a miracle. And these scholars left the meeting, and he said, God didn't come in World War II. But he brought us the nation of Israel again. Amen. And now we know the time clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Hallelujah. I got to get busy. I'm on a time frame here. Hallelujah. So we saw Hitler begin to have the concentration camps. And he was killing the very people God was calling home. Is, that, is my history right? He was killing the very people God had called. Do you understand when God's up to something, Satan gets nervous? God is up to something, he's up to something huge in the earth right now. And I'm telling you, Satan is nervous. Woo, hallelujah. You're not as excited as I am. And that's okay. I'm just going to let you sit there and you... Oh my goodness. When you see Satan raging, I'm telling you, God is engaging. And he's engaging in the earth right now. So Isaiah 43, 19, I do a new thing. Don't you know it? How is it that Israel could not know when their Savior and their Messiah came and stood right in front of them and they missed the fact that their Redeemer had come? But some guys over in the Orient called wise men, they knew. They knew because they had read what? Scripture. They had read God's Word. That's why we need to read God's Word. So a bunch of men from the East came and everybody says... there. How many wise men were there? 
I've taught you right. The Bible doesn't say how many there were. They brought three gifts. The wise men that came, came in a caravan. As I study that, about probably at a minimum would have been 120 people. And so how is it that Israel missed their Redeemer, their Messiah, but men from the East who had read Scripture understood the Messiah has come. The King has come. Brothers and sisters, I believe COVID-19 is the enemy trying to stop the gospel of the kingdom from going around the world. What has been stopped? Travel. What's been stopped? Travel. What has been stopped? One of the things I'm going to... Uh, and hear, the, hear me in the spirit. During World War II, there was no world evangelism at all during the whole stretch of World War II. No, there wasn't. Check it out. There was no world evangelism during World War II. What does Satan want to stop right now on the earth? World evangelism. The kingdom of God being preached to every tongue, every kindred, every tribe, every ethnos in the earth. That's, what, that's what exactly what the enemy wants to stop. Because God is birthing the church and getting ready to send a wave of his Holy Spirit all over his people and go around the world and usher in the kingdom of God. That's why his enemy is trying to shut down the world today. He's got to stop evangelism. If he stops the nation of the United States, I'm going to tell you it's going to affect two things in the earth. It's going to affect world evangelism and the nation of Israel. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So this is, this is the hour that we live in. And we just sing the song, who's going to make a way through this? And that's why the kingdom of God is so important. And it, it needs to be summarized for the everlasting realm of where is the kingdom of God? What is it? It's the everlasting realm where God is sovereign and Jesus Christ is king and rules forever. That's the kingdom of God. God is sovereign and Jesus Christ is king. And he rules forever. The kingdom of God is mentioned more than 80 times in the New Testament. 80 times in the New Testament. The teaching of Jesus Christ all revolve around the kingdom. Think, of, think with me. When Jesus taught, and he, he would say, and the kingdom of God is as. And the kingdom of God is like. Right? He never said, and church is like. And your denomination is like. He always said, and the kingdom of God is like unto. In fact, if you look at some of his miracles, this is what Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come upon you. That, that's, a, that's an amen. The kingdom of God. When Jesus healed a gal, he told her, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Amen. Jesus always taught kingdom. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. So the names in the kingdom of God are the kingdom of light, kingdom of heaven. And the word kingdom is used in the New Testament 162 times. So I, I'm going to mess with your theology and your religion a little bit right now. In John chapter 3, Jesus mentions a word. And this word is powerful no matter where you go. The word is called, it's a phrase that says born again. So let me read the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 3. He's talking to Nicodemus, who's a leader of the Sanhedrin. And he comes to Jesus by night, and it's about 2 in the morning, because he didn't want to be seen. And he comes to Jesus, and he says, tell me about your kingdom. I realize you're, from, you're not from this earth. I realize you're, you're from heaven. Tell me what your ministry is. And Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Everybody say, born again. And there it is. There's the phrase that is never mentioned before in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament only four times. And Jesus now, he's going to use the term born again experience. The born again. And both times that Jesus uses born again, it's in, in absolutely correlation to the kingdom. When Jesus talks about born again, he always mentions the kingdom of God in the same sentence. Born again, born into church, born into denomination, born into religion. No, you're born into the kingdom of God. Let me read his words in red. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Hallelujah. Kingdom of God, born again. They're synonymous. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus, he just didn't get it. And Jesus literally tells him, he says, you, you, you've been a teacher of the law this long and you don't even understand what you're teaching? Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to the flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Nicodemus, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. What's he say? No man can enter the kingdom of God. The born again experience is not to bring you into church. It's not to bring you into a denomination. It's not to bring you into an ism. It is to bring you into a relationship with the living God of the universe. And Jesus Christ has accomplished that. And we do it through Christ. So let me tell you something. 
In Matthew alone, kingdom of God is mentioned 32 times. In the New Testament, born again is mentioned four times. Four times, that's all it's mentioned. I'm not negating the born again experience. The born again experience is the ticket into the kingdom. Amen. But I, I, you need to understand, Jesus didn't save you to just abandon you. He saved you to salvage you. He saved you to salvage you. How many know if you've lived long enough that your life without Christ needed salvaged? Yes. Just by, maybe, maybe the rest of you reached a point, God bless you. But I know my life needed salvaged. Yes. Amen. So born again is four times. That's all it's used. Four times. But the kingdom of God is used 162 times in the New Testament. So when Jesus presented this gospel of the kingdom to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they had a huge problem with it. Born again four times. When Jesus started his ministry, this is how he started his public ministry in Matthew chapter 4. And he goes out on the street corner and he begins to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He needed to tell people, you need to have a new way of thinking. Now, I meant over this last Sunday, but I'm going to introduce something new to you. Jesus said this to people that believed in Jehovah God. Jesus said this to people who believed in Jehovah God, who had the Torah, who had the original five books of Moses and some of the prophets at this time already. And Jesus comes and he tells church people who are in church every Saturday, he tells church people, you need to repent and think differently. For the kingdom of God is here. Not church, not what man has built. God is restoring what was originally planned. That's, right. That's, right. That's what God was, Jesus came, that's his mission. Jesus said, I, I've come to bring the kingdom. That is the why of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his mission. To bring the kingdom of God back to earth that was lost in the Garden of Eden. I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. I'm going to prove it to you. Yeah, I, I, you're looking at me like you don't believe me. But I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to argue with God's word, not with me. I will not argue anything with you that God's word says is absolutely fact. I won't even argue with you. He says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said this to believers. Jesus said this to church folk. I believe that God is saying it to the church today. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. We're about to see God operate at a new level, at a new way, at a new anointing, at a new blessing, and something that we have never seen, the power of God flowing again in His church and amongst His people. I believe that's what we're about ready to see. Hallelujah. They told Jesus, we are the sons of Moses. We are the sons of Abraham. And Jesus told them something interesting. He said, I'll tell you what, He said, I realize that. He said, you are the sons of Moses, you are the sons of Abraham. But he said, they had a personal relationship with God and you don't. They had a personal relationship with God and you don't. And when he said, what you have done is you have had religion and tied it to tradition. And now you have no relationship with God. Jesus said they had a relationship where they walked with God and talked with God. And so what has happened is much of what we hear is the means to the kingdom. You must be born again, must be born again, must be born, born again. And that's 100% true. But you're born again to enter into the kingdom of God. Yes. You're born again to enter into the kingdom of God. And the day your denomination becomes more powerful than your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the day that your, your belief system, the day that your denomination or your ism becomes more important than your relationship with the living God of the universe, God says, I got a problem with it, and I might show up and talk to you about it. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God loved Israel so much, He said, I got a problem with the way you're treating me, but I'm going to come and talk to you and give you a chance. Ooh, I love a God that is fair and just and holy. Amen. I'm going to come and talk to you about it. Can't we reason together, says the Lord? In fact, I, I really think that we, as a matter of fact, we have made the gospel born again. That, that, that's, the, that's the process. And in that process, we have made the only gospel. And by that, I'll mean is, is when you'll hear this on television and you, you, at the end of the service, the, the man will have you pray and he'll say, get yourself into a church and... Brothers and sisters, no, get yourself into the kingdom of God. Get yourself into the kingdom of God. Be careful where you go to church. Get yourself in the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus brought the kingdom. He didn't bring church. He didn't bring religion. In fact, Jesus only said it twice. At 2 a.m. in the morning to a man who was about 75 years old. Don't get me wrong. I'm not negating that. The power of it. And that is the ticket. And that is the entry into the kingdom. 
But brothers and sisters, Jesus prayed in the model prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth. earth. Yes. On, everybody say on earth. on earth. As it is in heaven. That's the prayer. That's the model. When, when the disciples said, teach us to pray, Jesus said, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you exactly how to pray. Yes. That what is in heaven would come to earth. Yes. Do you know that the Garden of Eden was just a replica of what was in heaven? Yes. Do you know that? The, what was the, the Garden of Eden was heaven on earth. Yes, yes it was. Absolutely. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is not a religious experience. It's not a denominational experience. It's not a theological experience. And unfortunately, we have made it a church experience. That's what men have made it. And right now, if you look around America, I, I, the church is so divided, it's unbelievable. And as you look around the churches in America, basically what you hear is, our church is better than your church. Our church. It's insane what is going on. Our church is better than, our church is bigger than your church. I got news for you. You go look at the statistics sitting in your pews and see if they're any different than the world when it comes to divorce, when it comes to adultery, when it comes to you know, all the issues, pregnancy, child, pregnancy, child pregnancy, teenage pregnancy, addictions of any kind. Go look and see what the difference is in your pews. Hallelujah. I'll just let that be. I'm not going to go any farther with that. Religion had moved Israel so far from relationship, they did not recognize their own Messiah. They did not. How can you not recognize their Messiah? How could they not? Religion and tradition had taken them away. It had taken them down a path. They couldn't see and understand. This is the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. My, God. how do you miss that? And that's what religion and tradition will do to men. Jesus' job was to bring the kingdom. Our job is to spread the kingdom. That's our job, to spread the kingdom of God. God's original tent was to extend his heavenly kingdom here on earth through mankind. The Garden of Eden was the original plan of God. How many know that? The Garden of Eden was the original plan of God. Read your Bible. The original plan of God, original intent of God, original purpose of God was the Garden of Eden. He was going to put Adam and Eve on the earth. God was basically going to colonize earth with men. That, that's what he's going to do. God was going to colonize earth with Adam and Eve. And have a kingdom of sons, a kingdom of sons unto God, a kingdom that were not servants, they were sons, they were ambassadors for Christ. God's original plan was to put man on earth and take his kingdom in heaven and bring it to earth and spread it through the earth through mankind. Yes, that, that, that's what it is. It's that simple. Check your Bible. God wanted a kingdom of sons. The Garden of Eden was the original plan of, of God's plan here on earth. How many know that we call the Garden of Eden paradise, right? We call it paradise. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in... Oh, I just messed with your religion right there. My God, do you understand what I just told you? The Garden of Eden was paradise. It was heaven on earth. They lived in an unbelievable place that God had built for them, designed for them, hand designed, hand picked. God had built it by hand and said, I'm going to place you in this amazing place. They had a relationship with God that was unbelievable. And what's interesting is the Bible, it's an interesting book. It takes us back to where we came from. Christ came to redeem us from where we fell. Christ came to redeem us from where we fell. The Garden of Eden is God's original intent. It's called the law of first mention. How's God going to deal with man? Look at the Garden of Eden. Look at the Garden of Eden. That's called... Original intent. So, let's talk about the fall. What do we call the failure in the garden? We call it the fall of man. Bring me that book, Scott. We call it the fall. Everybody say fall of man. This is important to know. So, I want to demonstrate the fall this way. Okay, I have this book. It's my book. And I am going to put this book right here. I have set the book here. I own the book. I have set the book where I want the book. The book is now in its proper place. I have designed the shelf. I have designed the stand. I have designed everything that this book is going to sit on. I have designed it, and my intention is that this is where the book stays. I have placed the book there. God took Adam and Eve, the Bible says, and he exclusively put them where? Where? In the garden. In the garden. That's what Scripture says. He exclusively said, I have, I, Adam and Eve, are my, I created them. 
In fact, the Apostle Paul says, no, you're not. You're not your own. You're, you're bought with a price. You are God's. And God said, I, Adam and Eve, I have put you there. I have placed you there. And what is the first thing God did? Okay, now you need to get your religious minds out of the way. And the first thing God did is he blessed them. Genesis 1.28, read it. He says, I'm going to put you in this amazing place. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bless you. And he says, I'm going to give you rulership, not ownership, but I'm going to bless you. And he says, I'm going to give you dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. So, Brothers, this is in your Bible. This is God's original tent. This is the kingdom of God on earth right here. This is how God first dealt with man. God said, I'm going to give you dominion. And he's going to, he said, I want you to be fruitful and I want you to multiply. And he said, my blessing is going to be all in your life. Who put them in the garden? God. Original intent. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The garden of Eden was paradise on earth as it was in heaven. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, that, I'm going to tell you, you might have to study that out, but it's the word of God. But how many know that something happened and there was, what do we call that? Fall. What was it called? Fall. The fall. The fall. Now, Jesus said, I've come to redeem the world. I've come to restore and bring restoration to mankind and the relationship. Now, if I pick up this book and I put it here, have I restored the book? No. Have I... So if I put it here, have I restored the book? Where does the book need to go? The book needs to go where I put it. Amen? Amen. So when Adam and Eve fell, the book or Adam and Eve cannot get themselves up. They have no power to get up. Help, I've fallen and I cannot get up. That's what that book is screaming to me right now. Help, I've fallen. And that's what Adam and Eve were screaming. Help, we've fallen and we can't get up. So God sent his son to come and redeem mankind. But if Jesus puts the book or Adam and Eve there, has he restored all things? Restore. Restoration. Restore. Restore. Look the word up, restore. Something brought back to its original place, original owner, or original state. That is restoration. Jesus came out and said, I've come to restore all things. Yes. Says, Jesus didn't bring you back to put you in a church. He didn't put you back to put you in an ism. Jesus did not bring you back to put you in a religion of bondage. Jesus came to restore you to where you fell from. Yeah. That's what Jesus came for. To restore you where you fell from. Not put you here. Not put you down here. He came to restore you from where we fell from. And that is the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus is waiting for us to go preach that to the world. He wants to restore you from where you fell from. That's Hallelujah. That's what Jesus came for. Restoration. Restoration. He said, Stephen, I'm going to put you back where you fell from. Yes. And that is what the work of the cross is about. And so... Here's what God has done. He said the born again experience gives you the ticket for you to be restored restoration to the place you fell from, son. Yes. How many know if you want to go from one place to another place, the best way to do that is with a ticket? <laughs> if, if you want to go, if you want to fly from New Los Angeles to New York, I ain't going to fly today. I'm going to get one of them tubes at all. But I can if you want to fly, you can fly. I ain't worried about it. But if you want to go, you need a ticket. And God said, the born-again experience is the ticket. But the born-again experience is not designed to put you in church, not to put, designed to put you in religion, not designed to put you in a box. It's designed to put you back where you fell from. Hallelujah. 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 So I have not been restored to religion. I've been restored to relationship. I have a, my relationship with the Lord is the same on Monday as it is on Sunday. The Bible says that Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the day with the Lord. They had a relationship with the Lord on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They didn't have a Sunday relationship with God. They had a weekly relationship, daily relationship with God. That's the difference. That's the kingdom difference. They didn't need a... They, you know what? In, in the garden, they had no praise and worship team. They had no praise and worship team to pump them up to get ready for when God came. So they'd be happy and excited. They didn't. They were in relationship. Oh my God, are you in relationship with God today? 
That's what Jesus is after. And Scripture says it's our job to tell the world that. That's our job, to tell the world that Jesus has come to put you where you fell from. And my word to you, brothers and sisters, God blessed them. The first thing he did when he created Adam and Eve is he blessed them. He said, I put you there, and I'm going to bless you there. I'm going to bless you there. Can you say amen? Amen. I praise God. He says, I'm going to bless you, Stephen, because I've put you back where you fell from. Hallelujah. I'm back where I'm back where Jesus wants me. I'm back where heaven designed me to be. I have a relation. And he says, I want to bless you there. He says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Yes. Ooh, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. He said, I want you to have dominion in the earth. Yes. Those of you that's on camera, don't give me prosperity gospel. That's God's word in Genesis 1:28. Open your Bible and look at it. Yes. Hallelujah. We fell from relationship, not religion. Anything that does not restore you to God's original tent is religion. The gospel of the kingdom is about restoration and relationship, not religion. Jesus came to establish a colony of sons in the earth. Not not servants, sons. In fact, the apostle Paul says this, the commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth of Israel. Oh my, I explained commonwealth to you last Sunday. That the wealth of the king is common to every man in the kingdom of God. For my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That's my king. That's that's this place right here. This is where God has reestablished me. If God did not restore you to where you originally fell from, he would not be truthful with himself. He wouldn't be truthful to his word. If God restores you to something, anything other than where you fell from, it would be a lie. But the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. So Jesus told his disciples, they asked him, when is this going to arrive? When when is this kingdom going to arrive? And and Jesus said, the kingdom of God has already arrived. I'm it. I'm it. The the disciples have said, yeah, we know Jesus, but when is it going to be? And the apostle Paul talks about this. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, it's not things. It's a spiritual kingdom. But this is the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but in these times we're in right now, how many would like a little peace? How many would like a little joy? Jesus said, I have it available in my kingdom. Do you think Adam and Eve weren't happy and joyful in the garden? You know, I, I wish Adam had read the Bible to Eve a little bit more so she didn't know what to tell the devil when he came in. They could have literally walked the devil out of that garden with the Word of God. Amen. They could have whipped the Word of God on the devil just like Jesus did in the temptation, and the devil would have had to leave. That's a fact, because God told him exactly what to do. He gave him Word. I'm going to tell you, this is a worldwide event. It's a worldwide event. Anytime you see a worldwide event, you need to understand Satan is nervous because God is up to something. And I'm going to tell you right now what God is up to. What I read to you in Acts. God is pouring out his spirit on the Gentiles. We are seeing the tabernacle of David resurrected in the earth. The tabernacle of David. And that is Gentiles. Gentiles coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for a religious experience. Not for a religious experience but for a personal encounter with the living God. And God is getting ready to move my... Don't you perceive it? I look at this COVID and I think, and you know what I think? God is up to something. God is up to something mighty. We need to read the red more, pray more, be harder. We need to see God more. We need to be about our Father's business more. Can you shout amen to that? This is what God is doing. And Satan says, I'm going to shut down world evangelism. I'll do whatever I can. Hallelujah. YouTube, are you kidding me? You know right now, more people have been reached for Jesus Christ in this crisis. In this crisis than in the last 15 years. Hallelujah. So when the devil's messing, God's going to be blessing. My word to you today is Jesus came to restore you to where he put you. He came to restore us where we fell from. If He restores me here, that's not restoration. Restoration 
is Him taking me back. Amen. To where I walk in His blessing. I walk in His anointing. I walk in His grace. I walk in His supply. I walk in the, in the anointing of God on my life. God said, this is where I've placed you. This is where you fell from. And for me to be honest and have integrity to my word, I have to put you back where you fell from. Can you say amen? amen. God bless you. Bow your heads in prayer with me. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for the Word of God. The Word of God is true and pure and holy and righteous. And Father, you are operating in the earth at a level right now that I don't believe we even understand or comprehend. But God, I know you are moving mightily. Whew. I praise you for that. You are moving in this earth. The devil has come in like a flood. And he's nervous because God is raising up a standard. He's nervous. I'm going to shut down travel. I'm going to shut down evangelism. I'm going to shut. And the word of God is getting out everywhere. Amen. People are coming to the kingdom. All over the world, Gentiles are coming to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All over the world, Gentiles are coming home to serve the King of the Commonwealth of Israel. To live in His kingdom, in His abundance, His goodness, His grace, and His mercy. God, You have come to restore restoration, restoration us to where we fell from. I give you praise, honor, and glory for that. If you can say amen with that, say amen. amen. God bless you. Stand for the blessing. We believe that at the end of every service, just as God had told Abraham, excuse me, Moses, I want you to put this blessing on the people. This is the only prayer of heaven. In your Bible, this is the only prayer that God uttered from his lips. And these are the words of heaven. The Lord bless you and keep you. These are the words of God himself. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And God told Israel, if you'll put my holy name on your children, I will pursue them. I will pursue them, says the Lord God of Israel. If you agree with this, say amen. 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 God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a great day.